Morena. Morena Koto. Uh, lovely to see everybody. I'd just like to get us all started for a uh, pretty fast paced morning ahead of ourselves. So, Morena Koto, uh, ite ahika o tene rohe nati fatua o orake. Tene koto, tene koto, tene koto katoa. Uh, ko nei te kaupapa Auckland's Future Now. Na mihi nui ki a koutou, no mai haere mai, ko Pamela Aho. Uh, good morning everybody and welcome to uh, this morning's Auckland's Future Now bespoke event, our first one for 2023. Uh, for some of you that have been to our previous Auckland's Future Now in 2020, 21 and 22, um, uh, I have heard this morning say, gosh, it's a lot smaller. Well, it's a uh, perfectly formed group this morning. We're going to still have the amazing content that we have delivered over the last three years. But this year, uh, with the help of some fantastic partners, and today uh, especially Becca, we're looking at how we can really focus on, on some of the challenges that we've got right here in front of us and how we create um, a, this wonderful city given the challenges that we've had over the last few years. Um, so since that first event in 2020, Auckland's Future Now really has been come the platform for an open conversation around what our challenges are. And I'm really thrilled too to say that we actually do a lot of action as well as having these conversations. And so um, some of you remember in 2020, there was a call for Auckland to go hard on tech. And so over that the intervening time, the team at Tataki Auckland Unlimited have worked with industry and created Tech Tamaki Makoto, a strategy to take our technology in the city forward, creating jobs for our Māori and our Pacifica youth, um, ensuring that we continue to have multinationals wanting to come and live here and uh, attract talent. Um, the border steering group that we set up in 2020 and went right through and has now been reformed into another group enabled people like Ian Taylor to do his um, work in trying to find alternative means for people getting through the border uh, and through the system due to COVID. Uh, it led to our partnering with um, Dr Anne Bardsley and her team at Koi2 with the provocations around reimagining Tamaki Makoto and that was the theme for our 2022 event. Um, and certainly leading to really active business engagement uh, of the likes today with Becca and KPMG and many other corporates. And you'll hear more from uh, our guest speaker, Tim Moonan, on how to engage corporates more in this activity. So um, I'm Pam Ford. For those of you who uh, don't know me, I work for Tataki Auckland Unlimited, the region's economic and cultural development agency. And... Uh, today we are going to really focus on some of those things that post-COVID uh, we thought we would be right into recovery, then we've got floods and cyclones and uh, bringing right to the fore the sustainability climate change uh, challenges that we've got. But most importantly, Auckland is a very unique city in this wonderful country in that we are the global gateway, we are the place that needs to attract that investment and talent um, encouraging, exciting new businesses so that we can benefit the rest of the country. Um, we today are going to have a pretty fast-paced um, uh, session. So uh, Rupert Hodgson's going to come up and say a few words from Becca after this. Uh, then we've got our wonderful guest speaker, Dr Tim Moonan, who I'll introduce uh, shortly. Uh, and then we will have a panel discussion uh, for following the panel discussion, all of you will get your opportunity to have your say at your tables, and that will be facilitated for Matt, and then you'll go away energised and caffeinated to uh, make a difference to this um, wonderful city. So I, for now, I, I'd also like to welcome um, Richard Hills, Councillor Richard Hills. Thank you for making time to be here with us today, and obviously uh, Nick Hill, our Chief Executive at Tataki Auckland Unlimited. So, Rupert Hodson, um, if you'd like to come up and say a few words from uh, Becca, our partner for today. Kia ora, Pam. Uh, nga mihi nui, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā rohi na, nga te whātoa raki, ko Hodson tuka whānau, ko Rupert tuka inoa. Um, kia ora, everybody, and good morning. It's, as I've said, my name's Rupert Hodson. Um, I lead our Becker business in, in the northern region, which is Auckland and Northland. Uh, and it's a really privilege to um, be up here uh, supporting this revised um, 
Auckland Future Now event, um, and actually working alongside Auckland Tataki to bring this um, uh, to you. I think these events um, are really important, um, and this repurposed event, um, which is really focused on um, uh, um, action um, and coming together um, to align and collaborate, is, um, is a really important one. So with, that, with those themes in mind, I think just it's briefly worth sharing the journey of how we got here, because um, it's about um, um, uh, Becca um, as an Auckland business wanting to play more of a part um, in Auckland's future. Um, who we are, many of you will know us as a um, professional consulting firm. Um, we really got an engineering DNA, and um, you'll know us from our infrastructure uh, projects we've delivered um, over our last 102 years. Um, but we've also been working alongside Tataki Auckland Unlimited in, in its many guises for a few years now, um, and particularly um, on the, um, their role in bringing um, our cultural facilities to life um, and pre creating cultural opportunities as part of um, uh, Tamaki Makoto being a great place to live. Um, and we're really proud of um, um, that role. Um, and we're also very proud of um, our relationship with Auckland Council um, that we've had um, over those 100 years. So in, in reflecting on, on all of that, we turned 100 um, at the time of the global pandemic, um, and that prompted us to think about our, our past, our present and future, um, um, and who we are as a New Zealand company and who we remain in as a New Zealand company, but also our proud roots in Tamaki Makoto. Um, we started back here in 1918, 1919, and the Auckland War Museum was our first major project. Um, and we've been, um, and as I've said, we've, we've been along Auckland's journey um, as it's grown um, across those various stages. And now we have 1,300 um, diverse professionals um, working out of Auckland, and we proudly remain employee-owned. Um, so we're, if we think about, if we're, if we're thinking about that, for us, it's for our people, um, it's home, uh, and, it, and it's personal. Um, we've grown as to be a um, small multinational company, but our head office remains here. Um, and Auckland's been very good to us as a business. It's allowed us to grow. It's allowed us to um, be the business we are uh, now. Um, and alongside the role we've played in uh, building Auckland, we, we, we're really starting to understand if Auckland's successful, we are successful and vice versa. Um, uh, so we're invested um, in that, and, and we've, I reflect over the last sort of 10 years, um, Auckland really found its, I think it found its mojo um, once again around the 2011 World Cup, and it really, um, it was a springboard um, to prepare for the Cup, but post that, we, um, Auckland grew um, from 2013 to 2019 uh, quite, quite significantly, sort of up to, up to 40,000 um, additional uh, people a year, and that was um, growth within New Zealand and internationally. Um, it brought with us lots of activity, um, and um, all some of the great things about um, extra population: better restaurants, more concerts, um, uh, new talent um, into the city. But it, unfortunately, our infrastructure and incomes didn't grow accordingly, um, and certainly our housing didn't keep up. Um, and now um, we've been disproportionately hammered by uh, COVID. Um, and, in the, and from the flow on of the most recent weather events, which unfortunately don't look like they are anymore going to be one in a hundred. I think over, and just to um, context that over the government's reform agenda, there's multiple streams of reform that many of which are designed to uh, support Auckland issues, um, but also there's, there's global disruptors of climate change um, and the things that we're trying to do to support that, decarbonisation, adaptation, building more resilient infrastructure, and the opportunities digital disruption still plays. And we're still considering, is urbanisation still a factor? Um, and uh, what the ways of working, uh, different ways of working mean for our city? So, with all of that, and I hope we're all not overwhelmed, um, uh, back to our, our desire to pay our part. Um, the other part, that, uh, the role that Tataki Auckland Unlimited does is helps lead the economic strategy for, for Auckland, and it's a really important role that um, they have been doing. And it's really promoting our city as a destination for talent and investment, and that's what we need as a business, um, and that's what we really want to support, and I'm sure others do as well. Um, 
so we that we we were thinking about how we support that. I think one of the provocations that really got us going um, to further with more resolve is the um, release of the Koi Two reimagining Tamaki Makoto, um, and that was uh, the Koi Two report uh, with its nine provocations, um, and that helped us to think. Well, there there is some of those provocations um, are really good provocations that make us think more deeply. Um, so how can we support um, um, Tadhaki in bringing those forward? So just to sum up, I, we, we really believe uh, Auckland has the, all of the fundamentals, beautiful natural attributes. Um, it has um, critical mass in terms of population. Um, it has businesses like ourselves and the people in the room that care. Um, and we have um, 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 a, a trajectory and a history to build on. Um, so this, this event really uh, seeks to build a coalition of stakeholders that are invested in Auckland's success. Um, we want to be part of that, but we want to call for others to be um, part of that journey as well, to build New Zealand to be a confident, sustainable, competitive little South Pacific global city that can compete with the Sydneys, the Brisbans, the Singapores and this, type, uh, this uh, part of the world. So I think today for me is um, thinking about the role of the private sector, our NGOs, our universities, our iwis, um, and how we can come together. What are the, th what are the areas we're gonna work on together? And three themes for me stand out today um, for the, today's conversation. Collaboration, integration, and alignment of activity in our city, that's public and private sector. And maybe two more, action and courageous leadership. Thank you. Great, thanks Rupert. That's right. So I'd like to welcome now Tim Moonan, who is the co-founder and managing director of the Business of Cities, which is a UK firm. Uh, Tim uh, was in Auckland a couple of years ago, or it must be, what, four or five years ago now? Three years just before COVID. Just before COVID, right. And I remember we had a fantastic session up in the Grid Futures Lab. Uh, Tim said last night that he's in the last little while, just been in the cities of Barcelona, Santiago, Dubai, off to Melbourne, maybe tomorrow. So um, you really do have a great sense of cities and we're really looking forward to what you've got to say today. So over to you, Tim, thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, thank you to Becca um, for uh, everything uh, yesterday and, and today and those opening remarks. Um, much appreciated. Uh, a whistle stop tour from me to, just to get things going. Um, as uh, Pam rightly said, all of our work is um, operating in, in what I sort of tend to think about as the, the 200 leading cities in the world. Um, and I, I'm lucky enough to get to work in and for many of them. Um, lots of things changing, um, many things that I think are resonant with Auckland. Auckland is a, um, an example of a city that's, I think, been more acutely affected by COVID-19, but actually the common challenges, the common imperatives uh, are very clear that other cities are, are working towards as well. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So we're in a world now, Auckland's in a world of 10,000 cities, um, uh, of which, it, as you all know, you know, the world continues to urbanise despite the doubters and despite the, the critics. And um, that's a global trend, and over the last period of time, I think many of you have known that Auckland has emerged both as one of the hundred cities of the world that people talk about and understand as being most intentional and most distinctive in the global economy. And, of course, for a long period of time, the notion of the world's most livable city was very much um, to, to the fore in, in, in the identity of, of Auckland, as you can see, sh shared in a certain way with a group of other cities for whom livability, lifestyle, and, and all of the things that, that means, that means high capacity, high capability, public services, public investment, public strategy, alongside with um, a lot of new interventions to, to, to diversify uh, those inputs. But you can say that, in a way, Auckland was in this kind of competitive mode it's the way that we would see it looking at all of the data in, in the last 10 years or so but as you know as you know better than i do uh, like other cities that, it, that it's in a, a sort of uh, a peer relationship with it, it shares externalities about how, how does it grow how does it grow um, sufficiently um, with the right kind of infrastructure as we just heard from rupert what are the capacity constraints um, what are the infrastructure challenges what are the political and coalition building um, challenges and the relationships between Auckland and, and the nation and the nation state. These are the dynamics that are very much to the fore as, as we can see it. And, and other cities right now uh, have been thought, thinking about those things very much in the last five or 10 years. But I would say that there's, 
there's uh, a new, there's two or three new agendas that I think sharpen the imperative. Um, number one, of course, is that all cities are recognizing not only do they have share an equal responsibility to move to net zero um, over the next period of time, the quicker the better. Um, they also have to become much more resilient themselves to, to the manifold and sometimes unexpected kinds of shocks. And we all know that, you know, that needs system change um, and, and everyone will know about the different sorts of uh, sort of infrastructure areas that need real attention. But actually what almost all the cities um, we're working with and see tell us is that, you know, you don't actually achieve the progress in these areas unless you work on the enabling factors that you see along the way, the governance, the regulation, the partnerships, the finance, the procurement, those things, that, that things that ca can't really be done alone. Um, and actually, therefore, climate change is, a, is the ultimate collaboration challenge. But there's a competitiveness um, is very much part of that. And I would say, looking at the group that um, we have here, that Auckland has often been among, those cities are some of the leading cities in the world in now in terms of climate change adaptation, climate change leadership. And it's become a big part of the competitive advantage and the competitive positioning of those cities for talent, for business, for innovation. Um, so it's definitely a very important area. And I'm not going to knock the water on the computer. So um, uh, that's obviously dynamic number one. And number two, of course, is the fact that COVID, uh, exactly as we heard, um, affects all cities, but some di disproportionately. And, and, you know, you see in, in, in North America uh, and in Australia and, and in New Zealand um, significant uh, and, and, and sustained impacts. And, and this is obviously just one lens to do with, um, you know, working patterns, but you look at it in terms of transport usage, look at it in terms of other behaviours, a, a very significant behaviour shift. So we've got those dynamics that are very much to the fore here. Uh, and then this shift that every city that we've spoken about shares, which is a, a recognition that their city centres and their urban character and urban agenda and what really competitiveness is all about has to shift a little bit and has to shift to recognising that you um, have a business base that you want to protect and preserve and, 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 and uh, and, and reinforce and renew, but actually cities and particularly city centres are going to have to shift into innovation, how they host innovation activities, discovery, how they become the places for interaction, for joint venture, for doing things that are sort of surprising and distinctive and need that friction of collaboration. Secondly, they need to be uniquely memorable, experiential. They need to compete with those, those desirable suburbs and those sort of uh, digital nomad options and, and just uh, locations uh, all, all around that are, are in, in, in leading the, the digital space. Cities have to upgrade the quality of experience dramatically and quickly. And then thirdly, the, the notion in which cities need to have a, a larger overall residential base within some kind of proximity of the, of, of the city centre more and a much more of a sense in which the city centre becomes a uh, and the wider city becomes uh, a, a steward and a custodian relating to climate change and becomes a leader and a demonstrator of what it means to to enact collective action around that and collective behavior change so these three agendas almost every city uh, that, that we see in that group that circle of cities i showed you is realizing that their competitive strategy is ha having to in effect shift in that direction and you might say that the cities that move their quickest most intentionally and most collaboratively are actually the ones that are going to succeed um, and uh, in that regard, you know, there's this growing trend that we see that, you know, there, there are both challenges relating to governance. Um, there's also, you know, issues around capacity and resourcing. Um, but recognition that there's an ongoing requirement to continually work towards and upgrading the metropolitan governance platforms of cities. Uh, and in some cities, the sort of uh, the multi or, or, the, or the, the mega regional platforms. Um, but nevertheless, recognize that in addition to those, you shouldn't neglect those, but in addition to those, you, there are three other things that you can now work with much more seriously and intentionally. Number one, the role of enabling technologies to, to really make uh, pilot initiatives, make changes at, at both more efficiently um, and more smoothly, and, and also connect people and, and create sort of uh, coalitions in, in, a, in an easier way than could happen before. Secondly, harnessing capital, who's becoming a lot more intentional. Big capital is recognizing that their role in driving cli climate change um, uh, imperatives and also thinking about their role in, in being a major stakeholder in, in large cities is, is going to become much uh, more visible in the next few years and already has been in many cities. And then thirdly, the big topic I want to talk about really is the role of place leadership. This notion that we have to see cities as a public-private partnership writ large 
and that really means a combined form of leadership emerging. And in many cities, this has become a habit, a practice that is instinctual and is continuous and permanent. In other cities, it's, it's, it's tactical, but it's growing. And I want to discuss uh, examples of how that's happening just for a few minutes. What do we mean by place leadership? It's about combined leadership involving multiple sectors, uh, of course, people, community, civic bodies, universities as well. But the infrastructure owners, the asset owners, the major assets, the investors, the business community, uh, as well as local government and, and national government to the fore. And finding configurations and coalitions around which you build that connective leadership and coordinate. And you share intelligence, share data, share assets, share know-how, share competence, because there are, that competence is always complementary and, and resides in different places. Though many cities are recognizing that that's the route through which they can avoid getting stuck into a low governance equilibrium and actually both sit simultaneously focus and, 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 and continue to support the development of what you would call the hard powers of running the city, the metropolitan systems, the management, the land use, the tools, that you, the hard tools, but also work on the soft powers, the things that remain incredibly important to a future of a city. It's com combined a North Star vision, its ability to communicate to the world and to its citizens, its ability to show openness and be open to new commercial opportunity and, and, and configurations, and tell the story um, in a very effective way. And show, and, uh, demonstrate appetite for one's own future. That's something that's, in, that's a collaborative task and cities recognize around the world. So many cities that who used to have an entirely sort of single-minded way of, or, or single stakeholder way of, of, of running the city, seeing that actually in nearly all of these areas, but especially on the soft powers, you need to work on that as a team. I'm just gonna highlight six areas in six minutes, I think, of um, uh, examples of what I describe as collaborative place leadership and that this is really the differentiating factor we see in many cities. Um, firstly, the city centre. Nearly every city we work in, in fact, I can't think of an, an example where uh, there's a major city in the world that, that is uh, thinking otherwise, recognises that without a flourishing and renewed city centre, they are not going to re, uh, con compete and succeed in, in the future. Now, that might not necessarily be the same model of city centre that we had three years ago and then 15 years ago. And there's going to be a different mix. There's going to be those shifts that we spoke about. But it is going to be very much the fulcrum. It's, it's the creation of civic identity. It's the creation of, 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 of the innovation activities and the various um, coalition building activities that, that, that are best done in places where the dense assets are. I would point to two examples um, in Canada. Um, Calgary, the city of similar size of Auckland, one, one and a half million people. Um, where its city centre master planning activity has been done very much in collaboration with the downtown association of members, community groups, businesses, asset owners and investors who, have, who, are, who are very effective stewards of, of, of a pro, an engaged process and recognising, A, what you need to turn this into. I mean, we, we can't have a nine to five city centre anymore. We can't have a, a sort of a narrow base of sectors. We have to diversify. Um, secondly, that we need to think about place and, and at a micro level and we need to have different discrete ownerships or, or, or senses of ownership uh, around those different areas. And thirdly, you need to make the city centre planning a, a activity something you touch and feel and really um, engage with um, a, a, in, a, in a human way so people can, can work on that. That's something where business skills, civic skills have been used to sort of harness that process. Um, in Vancouver, that the Board of Trade is working with the business school to think about how the asset owners in the city centre can credentialise and learn the skills of ESG and net zero transformation. In Glasgow, the city centre task force is working on packaging up investment so that it becomes investment ready to the new cadre of sustainable investors that there are around the world, um, doing things at scale uh, and in the right kinds of portfolio management that you need to do that. So a big transformation going on in both the calibre of the city centre and its climate leadership with business very much playing a public role, uh, uh, working with the public to do it. Secondly, investment attraction. Um, there's a certain role, and certainly in Spanish cities, an interesting trend going on. I'd point to firstly Barcelona and Partners, a new model where you've got 20% public uh, partnership with 80% 80 private um, funding and leadership to go out to the world and target 
your markets and your three or four sectors that you really want to get the right investment into, and you do really, really effective and engage and lean um, investment attraction where you're continually operating globally and you're using and you're harnessing your, your global players who are most active in that space, and you're letting them um, play a leadership role in that. That's a new model that's, that's, that's working well and effectively. In Bilbao, they're thinking about, of course, we all know what happened with the Guggenheim and that transformation. They're now thinking we need to do that at scale around port, our portland areas. We need a, a company that's going to have the land capabilities of the city with the investment attraction capabilities of our big anchor companies and, and the skills to, to, to do that together. And that's a new model that they're experimenting with. That kind of trend is happening uh, in many parts of the world uh, to, to accelerate and, and improve and distill the quality. You don't just want uh, all kinds of investment in, in all sorts of places. You want to curate uh, the investment you need. Thirdly, um, Cities are learning that you have to tell a story to the world, particularly after COVID and all the effects that cities have gone through. But to do that, you need to combine and organize within the public sector, but you also need to um, draw on the, the global resource and capability and the, and the market intelligence of the, of the private sector. Helsinki, a city that's always done it its own way, has actually worked, actually needs to build a partnership model to do that where it's combined the focus so that there's a single way of communicating what the story is, but they've also found a connective tissue so they're permanently engaged with the medium-sized, smaller companies and larger companies to help them understand the story and, and, and add to the story. Similar kind of journey going on in Victoria, which is the 10th the, the city in Canada. Um, very interesting task force role for different business groups, different sectoral groups to tell that story together, have a crib sheet and a brand box that they will then um, do that confidently with and they believe it because they've co-designed and co-owned it. Thirdly, there's a very important agenda that cities who want to shift out of being tourist dependent and consumer consumption dependent in their cities into, into the innovation sectors and, and, and develop their science and research and sort of productive sort of reputation and caliber that they need to, to um, build uh, ways in which the private sector and the civic uh, and research communities can be going, going out confidently and globally. Barcelona set up a, a model through which there are 300 scientists and researchers and um, business partners who build direct corridor relationships with a paired city that they know there's a lot of talent that they can, uh, there's a diasporic ta talent that's based there, but there's also talent they want to attract because they've, they've got specialisms in unique sectors. So Barcelona's built a corridor relationship with Boston, with London, with Shanghai, and an alumni network that's really strong. And that's, that's basically set up uh, with the endorsement and the leadership of the public sector, but with the scientific and research communities very much proactive in that space. Tel Aviv's been doing this for 30 years, and I'll talk about that perhaps in the, in the panel later on, but big questions about how you target the cities or the markets you want to be really connected into when you're more remote from those markets, and you harness those people who are already in relationships there um, to, to feel empowered to do that work with you. Um, there's also a big journey going on. All cities are in some sense or other getting stretched and distributed because their labor markets and housing markets have, have moved beyond sometimes the metropolitan boundary. But that's something where you're not gonna get a, a reform to, trans, to, sort of, to organize that, but you, are, you can get different forms of infrastructure or different forms of leadership to coordinate um, that, that, that journey. We're seeing businesses very much play an, a proactive and advocacy role around some of that in different parts of the world. In Vancouver and Seattle and Portland, those three cities are getting connected up for the first time with, with, with rail infrastructure, with Microsoft and other leading companies and in Seattle actually re really leading that process with, with state government. And, and uh, that's a, a permanent partnership around which other things are now sharing data. They're doing cross-boundary work in a way they weren't before because private sector's shown its initiative to do that. And then finally, Business has a unique role to play um, and, and business leadership and working with its civic partners to communicate more effectively with the nation and with the nation state um, to understand both the value of the, city, of, the, of the big city but also to understand um, what is required from central government and, and others to, to support the city through, through challenging times. Bogota is a fantastic example where the capital city has gone through a period of um, governance challenge and the, the civic leadership and business base um, led by Pro Bogota has become the, 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 uh, the very generous sort of and, and, um, and capacity building um, group that helps to think about what's the vision for different uh, technologies, different um, uh, areas of the city 
in different er uh, ways in which the city needs to compete. Um, and that's very much about showing that Bogota's success is co is coincident with the nation, uh, the nation's success and, 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 and educating those about what, what, the, what the evidence is. What's the common mindset that I think we're seeing in all of those cities that, that are doing this, not, not just now for the last two years, but in many cases for, for five, 10, and 20 years, is that firstly, there's a recognition that one can point the finger at others, but actually what one needs to get on with doing what one can be responsible for, first, firstly. Secondly, businesses in particular, but also others, universities, recognizing that their success and their competitiveness is, is fundamentally linked, exactly as Rupert said, to um, the performance of the city and its ability to attract talent, to renew itself, to be a, 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 a fundamental, uh, a, a, adaptive agent in the in the global economy so it needs to work for, for both the, the resident the consumer and and, and, the, and the talent base thirdly there, there needs to be or there is an alignment of bra of the what is the identity and vision of the city with the identity and, and vision of, 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 of businesses within within the city and building that kind of alliance and helping to build a, a, a collective brand alliance is something that I think we're seeing more and more of is, is, is part of what place leadership is all about Place leadership is also about recognizing that cities are composed of places and we need to see them as ecosystems and sharing platforms that don't just perform, they're not, they're not sort of passive backdrops to the activity that will go on. They are the enabling um, environment that you have to really work hard. You cannot be complacent about any part of this city center or the city. They, ha they need permanent investment, but also ideas and support and innovation. Um, and you need different kinds of capital, bridging capital, big ticket capital, incremental capacity building capital. You can't just expect that to come from one, one place or one budget holder, um, but different increments and being agile around that is very important. And then finally, just want to really dwell on the fact that this is about helping uh, increasing the capacity and competency in the public sector and in the collective ability of a city to act. This is not about um, stepping into a vacuum, but actually very much working together and building a, a high trust partnership that actually ultimately uh, and makes the case for the, for the city to, to, to win um, reforms, win deals, win partnerships that are bigger and better in the future. So this is the journey I think cities are going on. It's the journey cities will be judged on and it's the journey cities will ultimately succeed on. Um, and I'm very interested to know what happens next in Auckland, how, how you and we and, and Team Auckland can organise around that and what, what the, the quick wins and the bigger ticket opportunities are in future. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Gosh, thanks, Tim. A lot there to uh, take in, isn't, isn't there? I'm very excited. I, I can see that we really do have the, um, you know, the partners, that we have the potential, we really do have that Team Auckland feel. So I'd like to bring up some of those people that are going to be part of that Team Auckland going forward. Um, uh, welcome back, Rupert. Uh, we've got Mia Brooks from KPMG and Jeff Cooper from the Infrastructure Commission. And we're going to have a little panel discussion uh, for about 20 minutes, and then um, we will go into our work group. So maybe, Tim, you want to sit at the okay. top there so we can see you all. Um, and what I will do is just quickly introduce each of these fine people, and we're going to uh, place a question to each of them. Uh, when we did a bit of a de uh, uh, catch up on Friday, the conversation amongst uh, these three here was quite illuminating and John Lavery and I were thought, gosh, we should have just recorded that and, and played it today because it was really fascinating. So let me just start with, um, on my, my left, your right, Mia Brooks. So Mia is um, Infrastructure Advisory Partner at KPMG, a Senior Executive with over 25 years of global experience and a track record in designing and delivering large transformational change programs in infrastructure and complex business environment across government and the corporate sector. Um, most significantly, the expertise that Mia has brought to Auckland is from uh, a really significant period in her career in Queensland, where Mia was the chair of the Queensland Government Infrastructure Innovation Task Force from 2017 to 2019. So uh, over your career, I think your major projects have covered an estimated value of nearly $350 billion of assets, so a lot of experience with Mayor, and we're really how, uh, grateful that you're in, in Auckland and sharing that expertise. 
Um, Jeff Cooper will be familiar to many of you. I first worked with Jeff in, back in about 2010 or 11 when Jeff was at Auckland Council as the chief, um, or came on to become the chief economist. Uh, but now Jeff is currently the general manager of strategy at the New Zealand Infrastructure Commission. That means that Jeff is responsible for leading the commission's strategic direction, advising on infrastructure investment needs, administering the national infrastructure plan, pipeline, and working with stakeholders to improve outcomes for all of New Zealand. Uh, Jeff has worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, Auckland Council, as I mentioned before, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So welcome, Jeff. Uh, Rupert, you have all met, and similarly, Tim. So um, let's kick off with a question for each of you. Thinking about the job that you've got now, but also in 2019, you wrote a very interesting paper when you were at PwC with Craig Rice um, on Auckland's competitiveness. And it seems like a long time ago, but I think there's a lot of relevance there that probably didn't get the light of day given what we went into in 2020. So maybe you could talk about a bit about your reflections and what you think Auckland should be doing right now in terms of competitiveness. Yeah, so this is a report um, that we did in 2019, and it was looking at um, the competitiveness of cities in the sort of uh, Asia-Pacific uh, area, right? So we were looking at Auckland, Wellington, uh, Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that, that the inside of that, when we were looking at things like wage growth, but we were also looking at, at next to the things like crowding, congestion, housing prices, all sorts of these things. We were trying to derive what a, a, a change in discretionary income was for the person that wanted to move to the city, right? And we then wanted to compare what that looked like over a 10-year period, so we were looking 2009 to 2019, what it looked like for all of these different cities. And the results of it were really interesting, right? Um, particularly for Auckland, and it became a bit of a provocation for Auckland because Auckland stood out as the only city of the eight that we looked at that had actually declined in discretionary income for people looking to move to Auckland, right? It declined by about $100 per week. Um, in comparison, uh, cities like Adelaide and Brisbane uh, increased by $400 per week in discretionary income. Uh, and so that became, to me, a bit of a story about what has been going on in Auckland for people that are thinking about living here, right? So that when we're thinking about attracting talent, bring, bringing in new people and capital, um, that's sort of the things that they're looking at, right? Um, and it was consistent with a lot of the migration numbers of Auckland, right? Um, and let me just sort of briefly touch on this. Auckland's net internal migration numbers have been negative for some time. Right? That means that Aucklanders are moving out of Auckland. Now, what happened over the last three years is that we turned off the, mi the international migration taps, right? And what we were left with was these underlying trends of net internal migration. And lo and behold, Auckland city declined, right? So that's what happened over the last three years, that we actually were just seeing trends that were happening anyway. And those tr trends are being driven by the fact that our congestion is increasing, like much unlike the sort of 1950s through the 2000s when transport times in the cities were declining, they started going the other way and we were pushing a lot of development further out into the periphery of the city. So people were having to drive further. So we were asking more of new entrants. At the same time, house prices had gone through the roof more than the comparison places as well, right? So we were asking people to pay more in house prices, travel further so that they could get jobs that were having comparatively similar wage growth with other places, although a little bit lower, right? And that is a value proposition, didn't strike me as a very good one, right? Um, so let me now sort of touch on what I think is, is the problem when we're thinking about growth in Auckland, right? It strikes me that the growth narrative has been lost in Auckland. It's contested now. Uh, some people think that we shouldn't grow, and some people are trying to make the case that we should grow, right? And those that are sort of the, the detractors in saying we should not grow are looking at how we've done growth over the last 20 years, saying, well, we've had all of these people come in, we haven't had our infrastructure um, uh, keep up with any of that. We've got bad environmental outcomes. Why would we want more of this, right? And the, the proponents of growth, uh, and I think the, the way that we should be thinking about this is, well, we can be strategic about our growth, right? We can talk about inclusive growth. We can talk about green growth. We can talk about growth in the context of using it to achieve other strategic goals that we may or may not have, right? So if we want to develop really good flood protection infrastructure, oftentimes that's very expensive, 
right? I think about a city like Tokyo that invested $2 billion in flood protection infrastructure that allows itself to get away with 50 mils of rain per hour. That has been done because they have high density and a large funding base, both things of which that we do not. Right? So there's upsides to growth if you, can, if you can couch it in a way that actually achieves these other goals. And I think strategically when we're thinking about how to make the case for growth, we need to be re remember that cities are fundamentally greener, healthy, happier and richer. Right? They make people wealthier. If you attract 10% more people with graduate degrees, your wages go up by 8%. Right? It's a story that's kind of been lost. Because at the same time as those wages going up by 8%, house prices have been going up by 20, 30%. You know? So we've lost the, the sort of net implications of that. I'll just touch on one last thing and then I'll sort of uh, pass on to others. But I think there's a really interesting case study of Brisbane against this, right? Because Brisbane is a city that is of a similar size to Auckland. Auckland was about the same size as. Um, uh, sorry, Brisbane was about the same size as Auckland in the mid 2000s or so. So we're sort of comparable. Um, and, and Brisbane obviously are growing at, at a um, pretty formidable rate. Um, they have very low house prices um, and, and uh, low congestion. They've managed to uh, use some of their industrial spaces by converting them over to mixed use much more readily than we have, uh, and so on and so forth. And they're a city that I think has shown a little bit more ambition, not a little bit more, a lot more ambition, right? They're hosting the Olympics in 2032. Um, and I think you look at Brisbane and you see that they've been able to sell the story of growth, right? Everywhere you go, you see the city building, but at the same time, you see the public messaging of this hospital is going to be better, right? This train means you're going to get there 10 minutes faster. Uh, these new precincts here means that there's going to be this many new jobs. And you walk around there and you get the sense that the city wants to grow and that the, they've got a comm strategy that is telling people why they should want to grow. And I think some of those things are missing, missing in Auckland. So that's me. Thanks, Jeff. A lot to ponder there, and you'll get a chance to talk about that in your groups um, uh, sh shortly. Um, for a different take, let's go to you, Mia. Um, uh, like Becca, you've been very active in the space of uh, calling for more engagement around the challenges of the city. Um, and given your experience in particular, let's um, talk about Queensland, uh, given the comment on Brisbane from Jeff. What do you think are the priorities for Auckland to focus on if we are to compete? Great, thanks. Um, and I'll probably just give the context of, I lived that journey of a market town, if I call it what Brisbane was perceived of as in Australia, and how they're now going for the Olympics and what that looks like in that journey and that arc. Um, so being involved in state infrastructure planning, flood recovery, um, you know, Cyclone Yazi they had to deal with. So this context of... Um, political uncertainty, natural disasters, and um, challenge in economic times. Um, so I think my takeaway in the priorities would be, you know, in the reflections on Brisbane was the, they had an economic boom from the mining oil and gas industry, and they could have seen that as a negative, or they actually started to use it on how do they use it, how do they attract, how do they attract people into um, into Brisbane. So I think for us, you know, looking at that journey and going, what are the learnings from that? Well. One is about that global reputation. You know, Tim, you referred to that. They they were positioned as a as a market town. Honestly, you know, in Australia, that's what they positioned. They had to think differently. They had to have ambition. They had to have growth. They had to support each other to actually say what steps can we take. And if you look at their plans from 2008 to even now, and the recently l launched um, Choose Brisbane campaign, it is about positioning and redefining what Brisbane is, and also telling the story of Brisbane. People were perceiving it as what it was in 2008 or what it was and how they've moved forward. Um, I think the other area that I saw that I think is really relevant is the talent attraction and connections angle. So very much around the trade investment strategies, linking into the education agenda and linking the universities, the polytechnics or TAFEs over there, um, to go, what does that look like? So if you want employees to come over, you need to know what the education system is. You need to know what the advantages are and you need to sell that. Um, that is not by osmosis, that is by direct intentional education strategies. Because um, um, when we looked at it, it was very much a 10-year plan. If somebody was coming to move to a new country, it was a 10-year journey that they were making. So they needed to think about that life's impact on their families. Um, and then the other side of it is in terms of um, the priorities around master planning. So having a clear master plan. 
we've talked about it last week. We had a spatial planning event and talking about it with um, a number of people from um, council and how the legislation is changing around um, the spatial um, planning and the acts around there. But they're really advantageous opportunities for Auckland to really think about how do you shape that agenda, how do you communicate that agenda, and how do you evolve that agenda. So I think they're the, sort of the three things. So, you know, your reputation, the talent attraction and connections and then the master planning really thinking about that but i'd also the part of the conversation we were having that debate we were having last friday was also i came back to new zealand in 2019 at the end of 2019 so i was doing my due diligence on infrastructure and i was looking at it going i had to google infrastructure projects in new zealand in auckland and i had to try and put it all together we don't need to do that anymore because of the infrastructure commission and things where we're starting to signal and coordinate and align to. This is a maturity journey. You look at Brisbane and you go, where is it now? That wasn't how it was in 2011. So I think that the bit is back ourselves, communicate strongly and, and, you know, and give the information, push the information out there because people are looking for it and need to find it. So we need to make it accessible for people. Great comments, Mayor. Yeah, that's fine. fantastic. Um, look, Passing back to you, Rupert, and you've touched on some of this in your opening, but um, Becca is really uh, putting it out there in terms of wanting to support the growth of Auckland. Why does Becca care so much about the, you know, making Auckland the best place in the world? Thanks, Pam. Um, I think it starts um, personally. Um, it's from our people. Um, our, our people um, are designing some of the infrastructure we've been talking about. Um, um, and they work with a range of um, public and um, um, private clients um, right across uh, New Zealand. So they, you know, we're professionally driven to um, deliver good outcomes. Um, uh, and so, uh, but, uh, so that sort of translates up into our business. But also, as what I've said in my opening, is um, uh, we've this is this is where our head offices. We are really. Um, driven by the same things um, Tataki is uh, driven by is to, to, to make Auckland attractive so we can bring in the talent um, that people um, want to stay, want to live, and pe 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 people can live um, and work easy easily. Also working with um, government, um, we can see the challenges of, of, of late government, um, and I say government in a, in a broad sense, both local government and central government, uh, really fighting fires at the moment um, and that's that's quite challenging and, and distracting but we um, we really um, would love to see um, a much clearer vision on where where the city is going where this what the city stands for um, and and want to help I think that's come out a number of times that really have a joined up and I think Michael said it last night a, a, a joined up confident uh, narrative about Auckland, both what it stands for as a, as a global proposition, but also what it stands for and will do for New Zealand. Um, so that investment into our city um, to make it thrive, to be a gateway, to be um, to be the global city for New Zealand is is not not debated. It's celebrated, um, and everybody can see the um, return on investment. So we want to. Um, that's really um, wh why we are here. Um, it's partly our role. Um, partly because we're an Auckland business and, and we do really feel like we're a connector and have a part to play. So um, looking for others to join the journey. Uh, thanks, Rupert. Uh, Tim, I want to pick up on something that you talked about that really resonated for me. And you talked about uh, the need to demonstrate one's appetite for one's future. Can you talk a bit about the cities that you've worked with? Um, how, do you, how does that happen? We were talking about what we want, but how do you pull all of those... Um, uh, agendas together and how does a city actually demonstrate or how does it do it? It's all very well saying this is what they want, but what, what are the, some of those soft things that are required? Thank you. So um, what uh, you see is that cities are starting to recognise that um, demonstrating appetite for one's future isn't something that you proclaim or announce. Um, you you build common vision exactly as we've been hearing, and that that's something where um, you crowd in the, the 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 historians, the creatives, the activists, the marketers, the those who are working globally, and you you work uh, out what's credible to talk about, and then secondly, you 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 begin to to plot that forward, work it forward. Um, 
game it forward, as it were, and, and think through what, what actually is the, um, the proposition we're making and how can, how, if you, cities like Berlin, for example, that didn't one, one, once upon a time have much appetite for its own future, just wanted to be what it was, um, it had been become much more embracing of, for example, its innovation character and, it, and its willingness to transform its places and spaces and um, it, its different sort of appetite to attract different sorts of people, not just the sort of underground creatives and the nightclubbers, but kind of a different kind of vibe. Um, they uh, realise that you have to let uh, other partners come to the table, and, and if you crowd in the, the 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 skills to do that telling, and then the, create the believability and legibility about what your story is, that's what appetite I think really consists of. Uh, so a question for each of the panel. Um, we've got a room of doers in here, uh, people who want to get things done, and, and each of us, when I'm looking around the room, I can point to things that you've done to to um, to make the city uh, better, or as Becca would say, make every day better. I think that's your catchphrase, which is pretty cool. Um, so in a bit of a segue to what we're going to do next um, with Matt Wheeler, but Mia and Jeff and um, Rupert, you know, what can leaders in this room, all of us do next week, next month, and the next six months, because we have had a crisis, and you know, you look at Barcelona, they were overridden by tourism, which may have driven their need to be more innovation-led. Um, you talked about Tel Aviv there, which has always been innovation-led. Um, it seems that a crisis is what uh, pushes people to do things differently. What can we be doing differently or as leaders right now? Thanks. Um, I sort of reflected on this from our, the last event that we were involved with, and the element is, how do you bring it back to your organisation? Um, so if I look at my KPMG perspective, um, we've been in New Zealand since 1849. It's the view of going, how do we become active in that conversation and drive that conversation? So I think for us, that was the, the call to action internally as well. So there's an external perspective, and we've got a team and, and um, support and work and collaborate. But also, as organizations ourselves, we need to be reflective and go, what can we continue doing, build on, have ambition towards, and how to um, communicate that? Because we're all advocates and ambassadors for Auckland. And I think that's the element that we need to think about. How do we, how do we help with that reputation? How do we help attract organisations, attract businesses, ways of working, ease of working? Those are the things I think we can do individually as, and then collectively to make a shift and change. I, I'm just going to use this as a pitch to talk about infrastructure. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the problems we face are because of things that we've got, problems that we have in our infrastructure system. Um, what has been interesting about working in the commission is thinking about, I, I came from, uh, from local government, um, so my view of infrastructure was always, you know, water pipes, um, transportation, uh, a little bit of waste, but going into the commission uh, has been a great opportunity to learn about the energy sector, the telco sector, and vertical construction and, and education and health as well. Um, and I think that's really helped me understand what's going wrong in some of our sectors right, that we actually do have some very strong performing infrastructure sectors where you think about um, uh, electrification and telco, they're some of the best in the world, um, and they have certain characteristics and traits to them, right, they have good economic regulation, uh, they have funding sources, uh, there's a user pays element to these things, um, they try and get away from centralised funds because they know that those funds are contested and difficult to access, times you need them, um, and you look at water and transport and you see that a lot of those things aren't there, right? Um, that we tend to sort of lurch from crisis to crisis. We're not very good at maintaining our assets. 60 cents in every dollar should be spent on asset uh, maintenance, right? So we often ha have, have this um, point that we make in the commission that if you think of all the infrastructure we're gonna need in 30 years time, that 99% of it is already around us. Uh, it is a call for action on maintaining assets, um, which sounds awfully boring, um, but for the people that are here in 30 years time, it's gonna be fundamentally really important, right? Um, so um, some of those points I think are, are, uh, are super important. And then I can't get past this idea of infrastructure planning, right? Um, that when I was at council, planning was sort of seen as a regulatory instrument in large part. And with the government's directives around MDRS and MPSUD, 
um, really we are now facing infrastructure planning problems, right? And we need to, I think, uh, uh, lift the lid on exactly what that means. We've said in the commission uh, that we would expect cities to be planning out for uh, a size of a city that is two to three times the size of what it currently is. That doesn't mean investing for that city, but it means we want to see what the plan for a five million population of Auckland looks like, right? And then we want to think about not just building stuff, but things like road designations, land protection, that sort of stuff, so that when you need the infrastructure, it doesn't take 10 years to bring it online, because that's how long it takes at the moment. And so we sort of look, we're always looking backwards, right? We're doing just-in-time infrastructure, and just-in-time infrastructure doesn't work. Um, and when you look at TransPower, when you look at Telco, that's not the approach they take. You can see what their um, investment plans are, um, much further in advance, and you can see that in the National Infrastructure Pipeline, you can go and have a look at it. Um, and you get a lot more certainty from those sectors looking out than you do from, um, from others. So I think a, a laser focus on infrastructure planning uh, for the long term is absolutely essential if we're to, to be able to credibly make this argument about why we should grow. Thanks, Jeff, and of course, Becca loves infrastructure um, and infrastructure plans. Um, I, I think I may have, I'm picking up on your point is a, is a good one. L lean into your own organisation and um, and 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 see what your organisation's doing and and where you can amplify that, I suppose. Um, but the other one is um, look for opportunities to collaborate. Um, I think that's one of the things that we can that 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 will be a amplifier. I think if we can find common areas um, to work on together, and, and an obvious one is um, around climate change. We, we, um, individually, we we can all do something, but it does require a collective response. Um, so uh, I think um, those opportunities to collaborate and uh, and, and get alignment um, around common causes is really good. Um, this is, um, I think, this is something that Auckland really needs is um, to show leadership. Um, so where where you've got leaders in your organisation, or you, you're you're feeling brave yourself and want to put your head up above the parapet and and be a leader in a space, please do that. And but also let's get behind our leaders who are um, being aspirational and visionary and 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 are courageous um, and back them. Um, it's really clear, um, and we're here at a. Um, a, a government sponsored event um, with Becca, but local government can't do everything. Um, and we've got to, um, around that collaboration and leaning in, we've got to find where we can, um, what the role of private sector, NGOs, universities, Manati Fatua, um, mana, mana Whenua, Iwi play in all of this. Um, and, you know, there are some really good um, plans. Um, there. There's the city centre master plan, there's the infrastructure plan, which gives some great recommendations on what we need to do. Um, and uh, we've got um, a really good um, um, act coming, the Spatial Planning Act, that is a designed to bring spatially led um, outcomes thinking together. So watch that space as well. So um, our next session, I, I think, is, is, is focused on what we can uh, lean into as a group and do together. And I think that's the, that's the big challenge and opportunity for us. Well, yeah, I just wanted to say in the spirit of, of what place leadership, place partnership looks like, I think there are four principles. We discussed some of these um, yesterday, but uh, I think, number one, it's uh, organisations and individuals um, moving entirely beyond a zero-sum mindset to a positive-sum mindset and spotting where those relationships uh, to, to, to do that uh, exist. Number two, um, recognizing that you can't fix everything, but you have to start somewhere. And many cities become paralyzed by not knowing where to start with a partnership effort. You have to start somewhere. And in doing so, you have to start with the coalition of the really willing rather than the coalition of those who show up. Um, and then number four is, is you know, building what I would call collective capacity. This is not about taking the credit for things or it's not about doing some things instead of others. It's about building the collective capacity of the city to, to, to respond. And um, that might mean some, some organisations leading and others following for a period of time, but actually the, the, the overall capacity of the city and carrying capacity of the city to lead is, um, is what you really look, want to look for. Right, thanks uh, panel. I think we're on time now and we're going to move to the next uh, phase which will be led by Matt Wheeler. But could we just uh, show a round of applause for our panellists this morning? Thank you guys.